Hey guys, thanks for watching this morning. I uh, just wanted to put a quick video together. Uh, well, hopefully it'll be quick. Um, as we've worked with Python a little bit, as we've explored, you know, various technologies, um, sometimes, you know, it can be a little bit boring sometimes just learning syntax, just learning uh, how to assemble a program, stuff like that. And you start to to lose perspective on, okay, this is just a tool in order for me to do other things, right? And so today, I'm just going to put together a lab that I've kind of roughed up. I've got some of the notes here to my left. Um, but let's write a quick game. Um, and by quick, I mean something that's relatively simple to grasp the concept of the game. Uh, it's not going to be long and drawn out where we have to really start thinking about um, the design of the game. So I'm just going to choose tic-tac-toe, right? We're not going to make it look pretty. We're just going to get the basic functionality that you and another player can sit down and play a game together, right? And it'll be something that you've written yourself. So there's a little bit of pride in that, right? And then hopefully you know, with that, you've also learned a little bit about the language. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move to my desktop here. Uh, let's see, desktop. Let's go. Actually, how about I put myself there so you can actually see me too. All right. So we're just going to bring up my terminal here. Uh, and I'm just going to start roughing out. Uh, a tic-tac-toe program. Like I said, I've got some notes here to my left, so uh, I have proofed out some of this a little bit. Um, you're going to find that maybe, you know, you find a different way uh, of attacking this problem than I do. Uh, maybe your solution is even better than mine. I'm not saying that mine is great, but it works, right? Uh, well, hopefully it works. Uh, so we'll, we'll jump right in. So let's go ahead and we'll open up uh, a file uh, that that will basically be our Python program. So I'll just call it tic-tac-toe or ttt.py. Uh, I am on a Linux machine, so I'm going to do the normal shebang here at the top, user bin and Python 3. This is just so that I don't have to say, hey, go ahead and use Python in order to execute this program. I can just run the program. All right, and now something that you probably haven't seen in some of our other uh, videos or other lessons that we've done is sometimes uh, you'll see something like this. If dunder name equals, oops, dunder main, and you'll see something like that at the bottom of some Python programs. Now, what this is doing is essentially you can either run a Python program directly or you can import uh, a file into another Python program. And so when you do that, maybe the program was designed to be imported, right? And, and you're expecting that people are going to import it and just grab what they need. Maybe you've defined a class of some sort, right? But maybe your Python program is not made to be like that, right? You don't want it imported. You want it run directly. Well, when you run a program directly, uh, Python sets a variable called underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore, dunder name, right? Uh, and it sets that value equal to dunder main, double under main, right? And the reason that I'm checking here is I want to see, hey, are they running my program directly? If so, do these things. If not, you know, maybe fail out, right? But in this case, uh, if they import it, nothing's going to happen. If they run it directly, I'm going to have it do some things, right? And so you may see an import of sys. And some crazy people like myself like to do sys.exit. And then inside that, we're going to call main. Now, there's no requirement in a Python program to have a main function, but I like to have it there for just organization, right? So let's say I call main. Main runs the tic-tac-toe program, right? So this is the game uh, mechanics running out. Once the game is done, that main function can return 
uh, one or zero, you know, something to indicate whether the program executed successfully. If it executed successfully, I'm passing that uh, value zero to sys.exit. And so from the, the command line, it'll say, well, it returned zero to me, so it must have executed successfully. Whereas if I were to return something else, it would indicate to the command line that, hey, something went wrong uh, in the execution of this program. So oftentimes you'll see something like that, right? Okay, so nothing too crazy here. Uh, then we'll just do a def main, and I'll just do a return zero, right? So our program doesn't do anything but fire up, calls the main function, main function returns zero, uh, and we're good. So I'm just going to open up another tab, and I'll see that I do have this ttt.py. I'm going to go ahead and make it executable. Because again, I'm on a Linux machine, and so now I can just dot slash, and it exits, or it runs and exits, right? And if I were to ex, uh, I think it's dollar question. Yep, there it is. All right. So we see that a zero was returned from the program. So program fired up, returned zero, and exited, right? Okay. So so far, it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, I can blow this up. I'm pretty sure that text on your screen was pretty small. So I'll blow that up. So the next time we run it, it's a little bit easier to see, right? Okay. Now I could have done this Python 3 and it would have done the same exact thing. If I ex echo that out, again, I have a zero that was returned for my program. All right. All right. So let me go back to our program. Okay. So we don't want to you know, obviously just return zero, we want something to actually happen. Well, let's first uh, put some of the pieces in place uh, that we can use, right? So the first thing I'll, I'll think about is I need a board, right? So we're gonna think of our tic-tac-toe board as uh, two uh, essentially arrays, right? So in Python, we, we really use just lists and so my board is going to be a list of lists, right? So I'll think of it as rows and columns, right? So each row will have three elements, right? So we have the top line, the middle line, and the bottom line. So I'll think of that as a list that contains three lists, right? So if I you know, kind of rough it out. It'll be something like this, board equals, and inside my main list, I'm gonna have three other lists. So this will be top row, middle row, bottom row. So what is inside those lists? Well, I could do it any number of ways, but I'm just going to choose to represent that if there's nothing there, I'm gonna represent it with a space, all right? So my first row is just a space, 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 right? Because nobody has moved in those spots. And so if I copy this, I'm just going to go ahead and paste that. Oops, there it goes. I'll paste that in. And now I don't need these extra brackets, right? And I can space these out so it looks a little bit more. And so this is the top row of my tic-tac-toe board, middle row, and bottom row. So it is a list of lists, right? Where each list has three elements. Currently, they're all just spaces, okay? So I have a board, all right? And this is what we're going to use, again, to mark down where people have moved. So the next thing I want to do is build to where I can display my board, right? So I went in and I looked up some Unicode characters. Now, if you don't know what Unicode is, what we'll find is that, uh, if I go to my other thing, or my other tab here, there are ASCII values. And so what you see on your screen are ASCII values for different character sets, right? So in the case of like an I, uh, 
it's equivalent or the way you know I could store it as decimal 43, right? It has a value. Or there's this thing called hexadecimal. If you don't know what that means, it's just a different way of representing numbers. Instead of having base 10, like I have in my decimal system, it's a base 16. And we can talk about that in a future meetup. But essentially, there are different ways for me to represent the same number. Um, but essentially, the once we look up what the ASCII value is, we'll find that, okay, I has an ASCII value of decimal 73 or hexadecimal 49. Well, if you notice, we're representing lots of different numbers here, uh, capital letters, lowercase letters. Uh, we have some punctuation marks. But what you don't see are maybe, you know, values that don't exist in the English language, right? So we don't have an umlau like in some of the German words. We don't have Cyrillic characters that you would see in Russian words. We don't have any of the Chinese character sets. Lots of different languages, lots of different character sets not represented in ASCII. So we came up with a different system called Unicode. And so using a larger value set, we can represent new and different characters. So I went ahead and I looked up what are the values um, that I could use for maybe a bar, right? So that I can represent uh, our board. And so I have found those values and I will go ahead and copy and paste that from my notes here. Let me copy and paste. All right, so this is gonna look a little odd, but essentially, you see this slash U. This slash U indicates, hey, the following thing is a Unicode character. And so being that we had to uh, expand out, you know, the character sets to lots of different things to include your emojis and all that kind of stuff. So the numbers got quite a bit larger. So in decimal, or I think these should be hexadecimal, 2503, it's going to represent, you know, a certain character. 2501, that's a different character. 2503 again. So it looks like these are probably uh, vertical bars. These are potentially the horizontal bars, another vertical bar, uh, horizontal bars. Uh, but I built them in a way that they connect together uh, and they should at least look fairly decent, right? So let's go ahead and give that a try. So I'm going to go ahead and call display board. And I'm going to pass in the board that I just created. So the board we have just has our um, spaces in it. So what we should see are just those, almost just the, the empty board itself. So clear. I'll run my program and I have a mistake. So display board syntax error. So probably somewhere in my cut and paste. Let's go ahead and look. Oh, I have an I up here. That's what it was. So in my set no list. All right. So in my haste of pasting that in, I accidentally typed an extra character. So there we go. So now we have our board. And so now we have our typical tic-tac-toe board, right? And it looks fairly decent. And that's as much work as I'm going to put into making it look decent, right? I, I really don't care about how it looks. I'm more worried about, you know, it actually working at this point. Okay, so we have a board. We can display it using the Unicode bars. Um, and so... The next thing we'll do is try to figure out uh, where someone can move, right? Because we want to make sure that if somebody chooses to move to a certain spot, that that spot is actually available. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look for the spaces, right? If there are spaces in the board, we'll say, yep, that's an empty spot that somebody can move to. If if there's anything other than a space, it's it's not a valid spot. So if I look here at my notes, I've got a rather kind of tricky way of, of getting it, but uh, 
you could probably find an easier solution than I did, uh, but we'll, we'll try it anyway. So uh, valid choices, right? And we're going to expect that they're going to pass in a board as well. All right. And now here's where it gets a little tricky, right? So I could do a for loop and work through each of the rows and then look at each spot inside that row uh, for, for the various columns. And that would work, right? Uh, I would probably have to potentially uh, nest a for loop inside of another for loop in order to do that. Well, there's this cool thing in Python called a list comprehension. And it just, it's a, a quick way um, to loop through something right and and manipulate it and the re result of doing this will be another list and there's some efficiency gained in doing so in python and so oftentimes if you can uh, replace a for loop with a list comprehension you're probably better off doing it but there are times where that might make your code look uh, a little confusing to people. And so in the case of this one, it may look confusing because again, we're, we're looping first through the rows and then in that row, we're gonna loop through the, the columns, right? And so having a nested for loop, we're gonna end up with a nested list comprehension and it's gonna look a little weird, but just, just work with me here. So the first thing we wanna do is, is work through uh, the row, right? So ordinarily we would say something like for row in board and we would, you know, go from there. Well, we can do something similar uh, with a list comprehension. And so we'll do our bracket here because the result of this is going to be another list. And I'll do something like this. Uh, instead of for row, I'll do for row uh, and how about row underscore I row in, and instead of just looping over the board itself, I'm going to enumerate the board. Now what this does is not only loops through it, but it gives me the index value associated with that thing. So let's go to my other tab. And I will go ahead and we'll do something like this. So we'll say we had a board. And in this board, we'll just put uh, A, E, I. And we'll have another one here. O, U. I have no idea where I'm going with this, but we'll we'll try it anyway. So for uh, we'll just say x in enumerate board print x. Now notice that it first grabs the first list, right? And it also returns the zero index value because this is the zero index value and then it returns the second list and it returns that and index value one so what we see is it always pairs up the the value and the index where it came from the value and the index where it came from so in my case if i enumerate board i should get the row and then the index value associated with that row, okay? So there's gonna be something off to the left here that we still have to account for, uh, just because of the way that um, list, comprehen or list comprehensions work. But instead of having uh, that, remember we talked about where I would end up having to do a for loop across the row and then a for loop for the individual columns inside that row. Well, I'm going to 
do that right here. Uh, and so I'll do for column underscore I column in, and we're going to pass in the row that we got from up here. Now this syntax again is getting even more awkward, but essentially I this happens first. The row and the row index get passed out here. And then down here, I'm reusing that row that came from up here. And then I'm going to go ahead and put a test condition on this column, right? So this should now be like that second inner for loop where I was just now seeing this space, this space, and this space, right? And so I'm going to test to make sure. So if uh, column uh, is not equal to a space, something like that, right? So that's the end of this bottom. So the only things that are going to end up bubbling up to here are those columns that are not equal to, uh, or actually they are equal to. We want to make sure these are valid moves, right? So they're equal to a space, right? So the thing that I'm going to return out to, the basically the thing that I'm going to build my list off of is a tuple of the uh, row i and column i, right? So I can just put now a return right here. So, so what is actually happening here, right? So what's happening, right? is I loop over the board itself. Now we know the board is rows and inside those rows, we have each of the columns that a person could move to, right? So rows and columns. So I'm enumerating that board that will return to me the row and the index value of that row. Now I further loop across the row to reveal the individual columns, which means I have a syntax problem here because I didn't enumerate the row, like I put the brackets in, but I forgot to write enumerate. Okay, so I'm enumerating that individual row. So what I should end up with is the column index value and the column, okay? And, th and then I'm checking to see if that column is a space, okay? So this looks really confusing, I get it. Um, but by running this, I will get back a list of tuples of the row and column index values wherever there is a space, okay? So let's go ahead and try it, assuming I haven't made any typos. So we've displayed our board, we know that works. So let's go ahead and get rid of that. And now we'll print our valid choices and we'll pass in our board. Assuming I haven't made any typos, which I'm sure I probably did. I did. So let's see, there is a syntax error. Oh, that. Poland should not be there. That's left over from when I tested out or I kind of drew out what a for loop was going to look like. So we've gotten rid of that because that doesn't make any sense for this. And it works. Okay. So I get row zero, column zero, row zero, column one, row zero, column two. Then row one, row one, row one, row two, row two, row two. Okay, so let's go ahead and mark one of the spots and see if it does in fact disappear. We'll put an X there to simulate that someone moved. And what we should see, this is row one, column zero. So we, that should no longer be there. So row one, column zero would be right there. So it's missing and our board or our validation is working. Okay, so I apologize for how this looks. 
Uh, but that's kind of how my brain worked when I put this together. Uh, but again, we're just trying to figure out what are the valid spots. Now, I could have done this with an outer for loop and an inner for loop and just appended that to a new list. So this could have looked something like this. For row in, well, we would have done like row i comma row in enumerate row for column underscore i column in enumerate row. And this shouldn't have been row, this should have been board. Now, if uh, column is equal to a space, we'll do our uh, valid dot append and we would have put in uh, a tuple of our row comma i and oops row underscore i and column underscore i we would have had to have had this valid equals that not that there we go So this essentially does the same thing as what this does. So this is terribly confusing. So it probably would have been a better way is to write it out this way. It's a little bit more verbose, uh, but it's easier to tell what's going on. But this should do the same thing as this does, right? We first loop across our row or across our board, which gives us our row index and our row because we're using enumerate. Then we loop across our row, getting uh, the column index and the column because we're using enumerate. And then we check to see if the column is a space. And if so, we go ahead and append the row index and the column index to our valid list. And then when, it, when we're done looping through all of this, we return that list. So again, this is a lot easier to read, but this does the same thing in less lines. Um, and I'd have to test it out with a large list, but this may even be more efficient as well, okay? So I'm gonna leave it as is, but understand this is probably more readable. Um, and so maybe when I upload my code uh, to our GitHub repo, I should probably replace it with this. But anyway, for now, that is the valid choices function that we're going to use. Okay, so we can draw our board and we can determine valid choices. Okay, so the next portion would be um, if a person chooses to move somewhere, we should validate whether that is a valid choice, right? Um, we could do this in our main function. Uh, so when the um, person chooses a spot, we could go ahead and test it there. Or I could write it in its own function. I'm going to choose to write it in its own function, right? So let's say we'll do a def validate move. All right, and so our move is going to take our player's choice, the character that they currently are, and our board, All right? I don't know why I indented that. But anyway, so let me look over my notes to see what it is I'm trying to accomplish with this function, because I didn't add comments like I should have. So it looks to me like I'm updating the board with their choice. So I'm going in, I'm validating that their choice was a valid choice. So I'm going to end up calling valid choices function. And if it comes back, as being correct, 
I'll go ahead and mark that their move was successful and I'll return true. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and return false. So by calling validate move, I'll know whether or not the board has been updated or not, whether the character or the player chose a valid uh, spot. So uh, I do have a try except in here. Uh, so it looks like when the player makes a choice, when they input it to me, it comes in as text, right? And so I'm going to first have to try to convert that text into um, an integer to line up with the index value of wherever they chose to move, right? Because we're not going to make this fancy where they can, you know, maybe move around with their uh, uh, arrows and stuff like that on their keyboard. They're going to give me the index value of the position that they want to move. And so I have to make sure that that is a valid thing. If they give me a D, well, that doesn't make sense in the context of, of, of a row. It's an index value, right? I need them to enter 0, 1, or 2, right? So we can capture certain things. So I could do a try. And then I'm going to go ahead and take what they passed in. So uh, I have chord equals tuple. And so here it looks like instead of a list comprehension, like we saw before, I'm going to get even more confusing because I can. And I'm essentially passing in a generator. Now, a generator is kind of like a list comprehension, but it's very lazily evaluated, me, evaluated meaning that uh, I'm going to uh, only return things as they're needed, right? In the context of what I'm about to do, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense now that I'm thinking about it, but we're going to go with it anyway. Um, Actually, let's not, because again, that's that's just confusing you. And uh, the whole point of these exercises is is to take what you've learned of Python and apply it uh, in a fun way. And it doesn't make sense if I you know throw in some things that just make the whole process confusing. So let's let's do it this way. Instead of getting a coordinate value, we'll say we'll call this. Uh, P row, so this is the player's row, equals, uh, let's see, player choice, I could put, yeah, we'll put player choice. Because more than likely, what I'm going to get from them, now yeah, we'll do it this way. We'll just do row, column, character, board. So the player's row is going to be int row. Column is going to be int column. All right, so we'll keep it simple here. All right, so I get their row and I get their column. Those are going to be uh, strings, right? So if I go back here, they're going to pass into me something like that. So they chose a one. So what I get it as is a one as a string, right? What I want to do is convert that to an actual one. So notice here, I started with quotes and I end up without quotes. Okay. So I have an integer value, but if they pass me something like D, well, I can't convert that directly to an integer. So I end up getting a value error. So in here, I'm going to try and accept value error. So if they give me something that I can't convert to a row and a column, uh, I will return false, right? Now, this also doesn't help in that 
I'm not necessarily validating whether they made a valid choice as far as um, whether it was greater than like two, right? Because you can only have zero, one, and two. But assuming that this converts correctly, they could give me 1,000. That's fine because when I look in valid choices, that 1,000 isn't going to be there, right? So we'll just keep moving on and we'll say if um, we'll make this a tuple of P row column P column in valid choices. And we'll say this is our board. So what we're expecting is this is going to return to me a list of all of the valid uh, row and column index values, right? Those are coming in as a tuple. And so I'm saying, hey, if this tuple is in this list, well, then it's a valid choice, right? And so we'll go ahead and we'll say board and we'll say this is their P row and P column equals character. And we could make this a little more verbose character, all right? And we'll return true, uh, else we're gonna return false, all right? So, so what's happened here? So they've made a choice of the row and the column they want to move in. I go ahead and I convert those rows and columns to integers, right? So that I can use them as index values. If I can't convert them, I'm gonna return false. So they've given me some invalid input. If they've given me valid input, I'm gonna go ahead and test. So I'm gonna look up all the valid choices on the board currently. Where are there spaces on our board? If they've chosen a row and a column that has a space there, I'm gonna go ahead and mark that row and column with their character. And this is either the X or the O, whatever gets passed into this validate move function. In that case, I return true, indicating that, hey, I have successfully updated the board. This was a valid move. If I haven't returned from here, the only other thing that could possibly happen is, well, they made an invalid choice. There's something currently at that spot on the board, so I go ahead and return false. Now, I could have put this else return false, but because this has a return statement here, I'll never get down here if this, you know, executes, right? So we're good. So even if they give me a super high number, that high number is not gonna be inside valid choices and uh, I will end up returning false. Now I could gain an efficiency in here by checking to see you know, the bounds of uh, P row and P column, are they between zero and two? Um, that way I don't have to do all of this and return a list. That would probably save me a little bit, but for now, we're just gonna keep it as it is. Okay. Okay. So let's give that a try. So let's say we have displayed our board and then we'll say I'm going to call what did we call this function validate move we're going to assume that the player chose they want to go to 0 1 we could choose one, one, right? They're, they're gonna move right into the center of our board. And we'll say they're the X character and we're gonna pass in our board. We'll go ahead and copy this 
We'll paste that. I'm going to copy this. Paste that. This time, I'm going to have them choose um, 15 1. So this is an invalid choice. And I'll display my board again. And I'm not capturing the return of true or false yet. Um, but those should be getting return from validate move. And so let's go ahead. And we see. Oh, I, I was confused. I was like, why is there an X here? Because in our testing from before, we put an X on our board. It's like, why is it not working? Let's go ahead and clear and we'll run it again. Okay, so we see my product should have put space in between my boards. We'll see the first board is empty. We see the second board, they moved in the center. And then we see the third board. This is where they tried to move well off the board. And so we don't update the board for that. Okay. So, so far, so good. Uh, and if instead of a 15, maybe they were to enter a D, right? So this is an invalid choice. Uh, we can clear the screen, run it again. And we do see that the board does not get updated for an invalid choice. Okay. So cool. All right. So we now have a board that we can move. So now we're essentially down to uh, some of the mechanics of updating the board. With the exception of we still need a way of determining if somebody won, right? We need a way of figuring out if the game is over. You know, has somebody beaten uh, a player? So I'm going to go ahead and clear this out. And we'll write that now. So let's do that here. Let's see, def, uh, we'll call this check winner. Okay. So. I'm going to do this in a couple different ways. I first need to validate um, is an entire row all X's or all O's, right? So I first have to check rows. Then I'm going to check columns. Is one of the columns all just X's or all just O's? Then I have to check the diagonals, right? So I'm going to have to check the first diagonal going from left to right. And then I'm going to have to check the diagonal that goes from the right to the left, right? So let's first check our rows. Uh, so one of the ways I'm going to do this is chars equals, and I'm just going to do it this way. Oops. So those are my valid characters. And I could have probably done it a different way, but hey, this is how we're going to do it. And I'm going to go ahead and just do the normal for loop. I could do my list comprehensions, but as I talked about before, those are starting to get a little confusing, especially if you're new to them. So in this case, I'm just going to do a normal for loop. So for row in board, and then for character in uh, chars. All right. So I'm first looping through the row. Uh, so I should get this, then I'll get this, and then I'll get this. And then from here, I'm looping through our character. So I'm first going to test for the X's, and then I'm going to test for the O. And this is just so that I don't have to, you know, test, you know, put two different test conditions in there, right? So if, and I'm going to use this thing called all, okay? And all that all is going to do uh, is look to see if everything is true, essentially. So what I'm essentially looking for is if I have something like this. All right. So we'll say this is my row. Okay. Now, what I can do 
is I had a list comprehension earlier. And I know we said we were going to try to keep it simple, but uh, in my mind, this is, is one of the simpler ways of doing this. So I'm going to say, uh, let's say position is equal to X for position in row. All right. Uh, for, oh, sorry. Okay, so what this has done is it looped through the row. So I got these individual columns out. So I kind of probably could have called this column to make it a little bit clearer. So I'm looping through the row, not rows like the board, but let's say I'm down to the individual row and I'm now looping through it. So I'm going to get an entry at a time, and this represents the columns. So for column in row, that looks like the normal for loop that we would have. So then what gets returned out is this statement, right? So for each of the columns in the rows, I'm going to test is the column equal to X. And so what I end up with is true, true, true. Whereas if I would have had a row of say something like that, I got true, true, false. Okay. And the reason that I'm going to use all is it's going to test to see if every entry in there is true. In this case, I've updated the column right here to an O. And so this evaluates as true, true, false. So when I say, are all the entries true? Well, they're not, so I get a false. So if I go back and update this as that, and now do an all, I do in fact get true because this should evaluate as true, true, true. So I'm gonna use that same thing. But instead of using the list comprehension, I end up using a generator comprehension, right? It does the same exact thing, but there are some efficiency gains in that it doesn't have to build this whole new list and evaluate the entire thing. This is going to lazily uh, pass in each one of these one by one to all. And so there are some efficiency gains that I didn't have to first build this, this list, then pass that list to all, and then all has to loop across that and validate it. Said it goes one at a time. And so it's something like our tic-tac-toe. It's only three entries. It's not a big deal. If this was a large number of values, uh, you would definitely gain some efficiencies there. But essentially, I'm going to do the same thing. So we'll say character is equal to, uh, or not for character. We'll say for column is equal to character. Oops. Okay, so if that's correct, and I'm looking at my board to make sure that uh, I've typed it out in the same way. So, yep, yep, except I did a better naming this time around. My notes here, the naming is terrible. Uh, so if all of them are equal to that character, I'm going to return... Uh, that character, right? So I'm essentially going to return back this guy one, the X one or the O one, right? Otherwise, I'm going to check, you know, keep moving on, right? So here we're going to, we are checking, um, checking rows. Now we're going to have to check columns, right? So we'll do check columns. Okay. So in my notes here, it looks like I am looping over index values and doing a very similar check. Yeah. 
So let's give this a try. Except in this case, I'm going to use a range. So I know there are at least three characters in there, right? So there are three spots that we're going to have to check, three columns that we're going to have to check. Now I'm going to do for character in characters. So this is my X and my O. And then I'm going to do if all. So it's kind of same thing as before. Uh, equal to character. Okay. So that should be it. And I'll return character. Okay. So in this first one, we first looped across the board. And that gave us the individual row. And so then we went in and looked for every column in that row. Is it equal to the character that we're looking for? In this case, this one's a little bit different. We don't start by looping across the entire board to reveal the row. Instead, we start with an index value. So the first time through, uh, see, oh, I forgot the in. So this is going to return to me 0, 1, and 2. And so I'm going to take that 0, 1, and 2. And when now I loop across the, the board, I do get the individual rows back. But I'm not going to look at the entire row. Instead, I'm just going to look at one of the column values in there. So the first time through, I'm going to look for index value 0 within that row. So column 0. And then I'm going to loop. So that's going to check all of the zero elements in each of the rows, right? Then I'm going to come up here. I'm going to loop back out, assuming that that whole row wasn't equal to the character I'm looking for. Uh, so I'm going to loop back out and I'm going to update C. Now it's equal to one. So I'm going to take each of the rows and I'm just going to grab index uh, value one, which is now this second column, right? And I'm going to check that second column to see if all of them are equal to the character, so on and so forth. So whereas in this one, I grabbed row after row after row. Here, when I grab each of the individual rows, I'm only going to look at one of the index values. So I end up more with column, column, column. Okay. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you. Here, I get the entire row, entire row, entire row. Here, I just get a column value of that row, a column value of the next row, a column value of the third row. And by then comparing all of those, I'll find out whether that entire column was equal to the character that I'm looking for. And the character is either the X or the O. Okay. So that is our checking of columns. Now we'll go ahead and check our diagonal. I don't even know how to spell diagonal. Uh, and there are two of them. Okay. So looking at my notes here, I'm doing almost the same thing. except that instead of looping across the rows and the columns themselves, I'm going to just grab index values. So if we think about it, the first diagonal that goes from the top left to the bottom right, that's index value 0, 0. Then we move down to the next row and move over by one. So this is now one, one. Then we move down to the third row and move right one. And now we're talking uh, two, two. So we have zero, zero, one, one, two, two. 
So I could literally just hard code that. And it would probably make more sense to do it that way. Um, just 001122. But in keeping with the way that we have been testing these from before, I'm going to do something very similar. And I'll say for character in characters. So I'm going to look for the X and then I'm going to look for the O. Okay. If all. So same kind of way that we've done it before. And what I have here now is that where up here we chose the range to give us 0, 1, and 2 to specify our column value. Here I'm just going to use it to uh, specify our index value. So instead of an X, it might make more sense to use an I because this is an index value. So it may help trigger somebody to think, oh, I'm talking about index values here. So the first time through, I'm looking for 0, 0. Then I'm looking for 1, 1. Then I'm looking for 2, 2, right? So if that is equal to character, I'm going to return that character. Okay. So first time through, 0, 0. I check to see if that's equal to character. That either returns true or false. Then I look for 1, 1. That uh, check that character, it either returns true or false. And then I do 2, 2, check to see if that equals the character, return true or false. Then all of that gets passed to all. And it says, are all of those true? If they are, then I know the character was good and I'll return that character. That That's who just won. So that checks from left to right, right? Now I need to check from right to left. And I can do it in a very similar way, except the index values are a little bit different. So we start off by 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, when we were checking from left to right. If I'm checking from right to left, I could think about it as starting at the bottom and working my way up to the left, right? And so what would the values come out as? Well, they would come out as maybe two, uh, two, and then maybe, um, actually, I'm incorrect. They would start out as two, zero, so the bottom left, then it would go one, one, then it would go zero, two. All right. And so what we're seeing is that uh, as the row gets updated, the column gets updated in the opposite direction. Right. So rows are moving. Uh, the row numbers are moving from the highest number down to the lowest number. And the columns, because we're moving from left to right, they're still going up. They're going from their lowest number to their highest number. And so here knowing that the board only has three values, I can do two minus, oops. Oh my goodness, I can't type. All right, so now what this gives me, if, if range returns zero the first time through, this is two minus zero, which means I'm gonna start at row two all the way at the bottom and then column zero, so the very first column. Then range is gonna to return to me one. So now I have two minus one. So I end up with row one, column one. And then this returns to me two. So I get two minus two. So now I'm at row zero, column two, All right? So this, by doing this two minus now, our uh, rows move, move from the bottom to the top, but our columns are still moving right. So I end up in the opposite diagonal position. Okay. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. But essentially, I'm using this same kind of all format in here each time. 
So once you kind of grasp how that works, you can kind of see how each of these work. Now, the index values here might have been a little bit confusing, but again, this is 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. So it's moving from the upper left-hand corner to the bottom right-hand corner. Because this one does the 2 minus, we start, we're actually starting at the bottom left-hand corner and moving to the top right-hand corner, right? Opposite diagonal. Okay, so we can display our board. We can uh, figure out which positions have not been moved in. We can take the player's choice uh, and figure out if that was a valid choice, and if so, update that they moved. And now we can even check to see if the game is done. Has somebody won at this point? So I think we have all of the mechanics uh, for all of these kind of support functions to play the game. So now we just need to build the main mechanics that actually you know carries out the game. So uh, let me move my notes down. And we'll do something like this. So we need a way to figure out as we loop through the players and their choices, we need a way to figure out, you know, do we keep playing, right? So we'll just uh, add a flag here. We'll call it keep playing. And we'll make that true. And we'll say while keep playing, All right? So this is our loop, right? This is the loop that will continue throughout the entire game until a player uh, has won or there are no more valid choices, right? Maybe the entire board is filled up at this point. Okay, so I will go ahead and above this, I will put players. And I'm just doing this to keep, uh, keep things somewhat simple for myself. And I'm going to say player one is our X. So I'm not going to give somebody a choice. And I'm going to say uh, player two is our O, right? So again, we're going to try to keep this simple. Player one is always X. Player two is always O. Okay. Oops. So. I'm going to do four player in players. So we're going to start with our first player and they're going to get a choice of where they want to move. And then we're going to move to our second player. Now, I could have made some something in here to randomize who gets, you know, gets to go first. Um, but I don't I don't care at this point. Right. I just want to loop through uh, and just and begin playing the game. OK. So we'll first start out by displaying our board. So the players can see the board uh, each time they loop through. So before a player chooses, they should probably get to see the updated board. Okay, so starting out, it'll be an empty board, which is fine. And then uh, I'm going to go ahead and remember how in our valid or validate choices, we returned true or false. So this was determining whether the player had given us valid input. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say move equals false, right? So we're going to assume first they have not moved, right? So while move equals false. So while they haven't moved yet, we're going to prompt them for, um, for some x, y, or row, column kind of stuff. And so we'll say row equals, and we'll use our input function to prompt the user for some input. And we'll say player, and we'll say, uh, let's see, we've got player zero, right? So what this is doing right here, player zero, so we looped across our players, and that was this thing. So let's say the first time through, we grabbed this. So what player zero gives us is their number. And when we do player one, that will give us their character. 
okay? So this is an F string, meaning that these are format strings. So anything in between these curly brackets will be replaced. So this player zero will evaluate as a one. And so what ends up getting placed in this string will just be player one. I'll put a colon there. Uh, no, I don't need a column yet or colon yet. Choose a row. And I will end it right there. And if I yank that, paste it, we'll say this is column. Choose a column. Okay. So now my player supposedly has given me has given me a row and a column. And so now I'm going to say move equals validate move, right? So this was our way of testing whether the row and the column they gave me was a valid row and column. And if so, it goes and it updates the board with the character associated with the player. So X for player one, O for player two. So I'm gonna pass in the row that they gave me, the column that they gave me, uh, their character, so player one, and the board itself, right? So again, this player one is not necessarily player one, it's what is in this index position. So for the first player, it's an X, for the second player, it's an O, right? And then we pass in our board. So assuming that they have given me valid places, move should come back as true. If they haven't given me a valid move, move should be false. So if move is false, I think I can put is false. I can probably put that here as well. I have a really bad habit of doing the double equals all over the place. So if move is false, uh, I'm going to go ahead and print invalid move. And I'm going to put in an extra extra bit of spacing around this so it's a little bit easier for them to see that. So if, if they haven't given me a valid entry and move comes back as false, because it doesn't come back as true. When I come back up here, it's still false. So I prompt them again. So I'm going to indicate that was an invalid move and I'm going to prompt them again. All right. So let's see if that works. Now this should loop forever because I'm never updating keep playing. I could. All right, so once both players have a choice, right now it will just exit. So I'm never going to test whether this game is complete. I'm just going to go ahead and, okay, so choose a row. So I'm going to choose the upper left hand column. So I'll do a zero, zero. Okay, yep, so it put my X there. Now, player two, I'm going to give it zero, zero again. So that comes back as an invalid move because you know the first player already moved there. Uh, what if I put D zero? It's gonna give me invalid move. Okay, so let me do one one. So now this is the center. That was a valid choice uh, and I exited out of the game. Um, so it looks to me like this is working. It's gonna prompt my user for the row and the column that they want. It's going to indicate whether uh, they're, they chose something invalid, and then it's going to move on.
Okay. So, assuming that I have gotten a good uh, move from that player, the next thing I need to do is, since the board has been updated, are we done? Do we have a winner of the game? So, if check winner, I'm going to pass in my board, print. Uh, I'm going to print that if I now have a win, so we're assuming that this last move won the game. So I'm not necessarily checking to see the return of, of who won because, I mean, it should be this player. So... Uh, so I think check winner should have returned instead of returning the character. That's funny. My notes are incorrect. Oh, I know why my notes are incorrect because I missed this last piece. So, in my check winner, I first check the row. If one of the rows is complete, I return the character associated with that. Um, but realistically speaking, it doesn't necessarily matter. But I like knowing that it's going to return the character that was done because that makes it easy to see whether this is uh, returning valid results. Um, then I check my columns. If one of them is all the same character, I go ahead and indicate so. Then I check my diagonals. If that is done, I go ahead and update, update that as well. Now, I could return false here. And I feel like that would probably be somewhat valid. Except that these are all returning a character. So I feel like you should probably stick with that kind of rhyme or reason. So if I'm not returning a character, meaning that nobody has won, I'm going to go ahead and return none. Now, I could have probably gotten away with not returning anything at this point, uh, meaning that nobody above won. Nobody row in a won in a row, nobody won in a column, nobody won in a diagonal. I could not return anything because I think by default, uh, Python's going to return none if I don't specify some other return. But to be a little bit more explicit, I'm going to go ahead and return none. And so in my check here, I'm doing if check winner. So if a character comes back, this should evaluate as true. So we could test that. Let me go ahead and clear this. If a print, yes. Else print, no. Oops, that's going to be an error. Oh, well. It gave me a yes. So, meaning that just evaluating the presence of something is going to va evaluate uh, as true. Now, if I were to if none print yes, I don't get anything back out, right? And so that's the condition that I'm that I'm working off of. Now, I don't think that's probably the best way to do it. I'll do it instead of if check board or check winner of the board. I'll do is uh, is not none, is not none. So it's a little bit more explicit that you know. Looking at it, you can say, well, if none comes back, nobody won. Otherwise, somebody did win. Print uh, the winner is player. And I'll do this as player 
and we'll grab the zero out of that. So this will grab their player number. All right, the winner is player, you know, whatever. Okay, and we'll return. Or let's not return. Let's do it this way. Keep playing goals false, and we'll break. So this break is going to break out of this for loop. This keep playing will stop this while loop, right? So hopefully that all works correctly. Now we need to check to see if there are no valid choices left, right? So maybe the board is now filled, so there's no point in prompting a user to choose a position when there's nowhere for them to move to, right? So here we're gonna do if len of uh, valid choices. So this was our function that returned to us that list of all of the valid choices. So if this list comes back as empty, we know the board is full. So if the length valid choices will print, there are, or the game is a tie. And we'll do keep playing equals false. And we will break. All right. So if everything works, we should see that either a player wins and keep playing gets set to false and we break out of this for loop or uh, the board is full. So we also stop uh, keep playing and we break out of this and we should return zero. So if this is good. We'll say player zero is going to move into zero, zero. The game is a tie. So I forgot this len check. Len is equal to zero. because a number came back. We just validated that something came back. All right, so zero, zero works. Uh, player two now chooses one, one. So we block and let's say player two now goes to two, zero. So in their bottom left-hand corner. And then we'll say, oh, I'm gonna block that two. So we'll do a one, zero. And so player one decides, okay, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, I don't want to win or I don't want the guy to win. So I'm going to go there. Uh, so then we'll go, oh, let's see, two, one. So now we're in the bottom. So we'll do a zero, one. And we've blocked him there. So, well, I can't have him winning up in this corner. So let me go zero, two. Okay, so the only valid place now to move is to two, and the game is a tie. So we know ties work. So let's go ahead and see about a zero, zero, and we'll choose one, one, and we'll choose zero, one, and we'll choose uh, one, zero, and then we'll choose zero, two, and player one now wins because they won with the row. And I should probably at least display the board one last time so we can see they did in fact win. All right, so now we know rows work. Let's test columns. So zero, zero, one, 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 zero, uh, one, two, and then two, zero. 
All right, player one is the winner and we now do display our board. So we see that works. So now we know rows work, columns work, um, ties work. Now we need to test our diagonals. So zero, zero, we'll do a one, zero. I uh, will choose one, one. We'll choose uh, two, zero. And we'll choose two, two. All right, so diagonals from left to right work. And now we'll choose one, or, or, sorry, two, zero. And we'll choose one, zero. And we'll choose one, one. So now we'll choose zero, zero. And we'll choose this is zero, two. And diagonals in the other direction work as well from the bottom to the top. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, like I said, some of the uh, list comprehensions and generators can be a little bit confusing, uh, but once you get used to using them, you'll find that uh, at least my brain seems to jump to those probably sooner than it should. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So the main loop is fairly simplistic, which is good for a game. You know, it ju it's just going to keep looping. This is like our forever kind of loop. Um, it basically just dictates the the things that will take place, you know, throughout the game. But it doesn't necessarily implement those things. We have all of our helper functions above that do that so that it keeps this nice and concise to, uh, to make it easier to read. So we validate our moves, we check for winners, uh, we check our valid choices, uh, we can display our board as needed. But again, this is just the main uh, logic of the game, and it relies on all of these uh, helper functions in order to carry that out. So this ended up turning into a lot longer video than I was hoping and uh, I jumped around a lot and it was probably confusing, uh, but I hope that you got something out of it. At a minimum, you got to see the enumerate function. Uh, you at least know that there's things, things called list comprehensions and generators and we can dig into those deeper. But I wanted you to see how, you know, you can take some fairly simple logic and it could either get really complex or you could keep it simple, just knock out the, the little things that you need to do uh, with some of these helper functions, and then bring all these helper functions together in your main function where you actually uh, play out the logic of the game itself, right? So the helper functions are all kind of the mechanics of the game, whereas this main function is the logic of the game. So thanks for watching, guys. Again, hope it was helpful, and I will see you later. All right.